Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the nice work, words. And, and actually, um, also, thank you for the invitation. I mean, it's so great that you pushed the Hessian Center. And by the way, I hope everyone noticed this nice wordplay of Hessian coming from optimization, the Hessian metrics and being in Hesse. And then finally, because you were touching upon Fraunhofer, um, I think Fraunhofer is so much required in really getting AI into the, um, yeah, into society in all aspects and also doing all this great research. So I'm super happy that Fraunhofer is also part of this ecosystem in Darmstadt, but also in Germany and in that sense also internationally. Um, anyhow, let me, let me also start um, going into my talk, which is after the last talk, I feel a little bit like, hmm, let's see whether I really make a deeper uh, contributions, but let's see. So what I would like to talk about is making deep neural networks right for the right scientific reasons. And let me try to also um, motivate that a little bit. And I'm not showing you results already here, but you have heard about all these great things about deep learning and particularly in imaging, but also in all the other areas in the health um, sector in uh, medicine. And me being, although I, I have a background also in making use of um, statistical relational learning in, to, to understand electronic health records, what was so amazing to me was this push in the early year and still you have it, of all these deep learning, imaging, whatever, on COVID archive articles. And at some point, Tom Dietrich was getting, I guess, quite nervous also about that because they are all these very fast track papers and maybe we need to um, understand better the pros and the cons and really trying to understand is it done right or wrong if you, for example, do not involve any of the medical experts, right? So the, the big question there is when you have set up and you can do that very experts, but maybe also in other ways um, and um, combined ways, the question is or whether these networks are really right for the right reasons. So put it slightly different and um, thanks um, Ram for also picking up this overall story. It's that in my opinion, data is amazing and you can do a lot with data. And yes, maybe with pre-trained models, um, you don't need much of additional data to specialize your network. But overall data is not everything, right? We need also reasoning and we need also ways to maybe communicate with these um, AI methods. And these AI methods, they should also somehow help us in recognizing new situation, right? They should not just pretend it's some input and I continues with whatever I was trained on, but maybe also give you the idea that hmm, maybe this is strange here. I've never seen something like that. And so they should be able to recognize that and ultimately to also adapt to them. And so that is what at least according to the US and many people in the UK and also in Germany is called the third wave of AI. And of course you can debate whether it's the third wave or the fourth wave already, but it's really this idea to make our systems, well, you may say human-like, more human-like or more human-centric. Uh, at least we want to get more reasoning together uh, into the learning systems, um, getting a tight integration of reasoning and learning and this out of sample um, question, how do we deal with things that we haven't seen um, before at training time? That's at really at the core of this question. But let me also explain this now really in a little bit more into details. And I, I'm preaching to the choir here when I said deep neural networks had a really deep impact and were leading to many, many breakthroughs. And you know them as much as I do and most likely even better. In the end, deep neural networks, in my opinion, are actually more about differentiable programming. Um, and I will maybe touch upon that in the very end of the talk, but keep that in mind that maybe this biological motivation is good, but it's maybe in the end, not what is really important, at least from a computer science perspective, although it might also always give you a little bit of a, of a motivation for your next step. And also we were lucky enough to um, make one of these little contributions there in the sense of, uh, we were showing that if you apply alpha zero um, directly on a new variant, well, not a new, on a different variant of chess, then actually it breaks down because it had no bias in there telling it 
that this variant of chess can't be solved and this variant was drop chess. So in drop chess, when you capture pieces, you can reintroduce them at any time later in the game um, on your side under your color. And what was happening with the original architecture is that it actually tries to put this piece on an occupied um, field already, right? So this is what is missing, so to say, in these standard architectures. And then you have to get lucky enough to find the right way to code that and have to retrain again. But yes, you can do it. And you can then also, again, um, defend the world champion. So that's nice. On the other hand, there's a lot of discussion going on about all these biases maybe captured by the deep neural networks and biases that go beyond the standard bias variance trade-offs that we typically like to talk about in the machine learning uh, environment and machine learning community. And if you think a little bit closer, th this is a deep question because it's also this question about society. Is that just a mirror of what we are doing as a society because we learn from this data? Are there maybe algorithmic uh, ways to debias your data and so on and so on. And this was all triggered a lot by all the examples that you know as well. So on the one hand, on the left hand side, you see this famous example where you can just wear glasses or print specialized uh, glasses and then all of a sudden you look very different to a particular deep network. Uh, you may add some noise, very basic um, stuff here to turn a panda into a gibbon and even increasing the confidence. And you may also somehow show really if you train these systems on tons of textual data that they may carry over some of the um, yeah, human-like biases that are captured in the data just implicitly by the way when, when we write we also implicitly show or express biases in, in the society, right? And in particular, this, this work by Carlos Canet uh, was getting a lot of attention in the press, um, going into the direction of AI becoming racist and all this stuff. So I got a little bit worried there and I was wondering whether we can also um, yeah, counter attack that. And uh, we were, for example, showing that the very same system, slightly different algorithmic approach, but that was um, only because there was advancement on, on the algorithmic side, can also capture, for example, our own um, values, moral ethical values. And because I think it's very important that these machines understand that killing humans is maybe not what we want, at least in general, and then contextualize. Uh, who knows what the, is the answer? But my, my main point is here really that uh, we should not just go into one direction. We should always understand both sides in order to come up with really something that is beneficial to the whole society. Generally, because of all these discussions, there's all this new work on explainable AI um, asking in a sense, can we trust deep neural networks? And again, given that it's about differentiable programming, this is not only about deep neural networks. You can ask the very same question about more classical statistical machine learning approaches, but also um, maybe the ones coming in the future. And there are many of these works. Here's one particular one. And for example, they are trying to invert, in a sense, um, your neural network, and then trying to tell you for this input, this decision was done because of these important features in the input, right? So this is really exciting work, but it also does not tell you really how to fix the issue, right? It's just telling you maybe something goes wrong, but it doesn't tell you how to fix it. And then you may go back to your data and massage it, and then you retrain again or wh wh whatever. So we were more interested in how can we actually fix this now? How can we continue maybe learning by taking feedback from the user into account? So next to the understandable or how, how to understand a model dimension, which might be called explainable AI, we also think that interactive learning is quite important here because interaction um, is also known to boost or help um, to build trust. Right? So it's not only to explain your decision, but also have the option to interact with the person or the system that is trying to explain you something. So you may see it a little bit like giving a, a lecture and either you do it frontal, not giving you any feedback or you're going into interactions. And if you're interaction, um, typically you appreciate the lecture much more. So what we were coming up with what we are calling explanatory interactive learning, where you actually revise 
the system by interacting with its explanations. Uh, let me show you a little bit more what that means. So here's this very famous examples of Huskies and rules, and then you trained your deep network. And then maybe you did not have enough variance or variation in your data. Uh, you know, it may come up with some good um, predictions, but if you're asked, why are you predicting here? You're getting the wrong explanation or the right explanations for this predictions, but it's the wrong explanation in terms of what you would like to have used as an explanation. So here in particular, you're getting this idea, yes, it's a husky because there is snow in the background. So by accident, you realize that there was this implicit bias in your data that whenever you saw a husky, there was snow in the background. Whenever you didn't see a husky, there was no snow in the background. And the system picked that up, right? Nothing wrong with the system per se, because um, you never told the system to really focus on the concept of a husky per se, right? So we would like now to make use of the expert or the user saying, yeah, maybe it's a husky, but not because of those pixels. And there are different ways you can can do that um, to realize that. And it's actually not too hard. So um, if we start with looking at uh, the false positive segments, um, currently there's also a lot of research in trying to get this interaction also on the true positive and um, all the other combinations in there. But if your system is differentiable, and uh, then you may use what um, Ross et al. and Finale Doshi were introducing in their Right for the Right Reasons paper, where you essentially have the standard loss that you had for classification. Here's a cross entropy. And then you have additional regularization terms where you have this little mask here. And this mask is just taking this feedback um, of the explanation. You say, avoid that. So essentially, you're masking that part out and you tell the system, don't make use of the um, of the gradients for this part of your input image, plus some standard regularization. What we were doing is we were, ex oops, uh, sorry about that. We were extending that even um, to a model agnostic approach so that you can make use of any uh, machine learning um, model here. And the idea is rather simple, right? In order to make these parts that you don't want to be used as explanations anymore, you can actually do a form of data augmentation where you put uh, uniform samples um, on these regions, right? So essentially you're telling, you're, you're breaking the correlation with the class label um, by extending the data set with a lot of uncorrelated parts, at least for the parts used or regions used for the, for the learning. If you do that, actually you can show it works more or less as good as you go for the differentiable part. Um, you can also show, of course, that it works, for example, here on the Pascal um, work data set where there was this very famous bias in there when it about classifying horses, yes and no. And then for horses, there was always this copyright mark in the lower uh, uh, left corner. And so when you just train your standard deep network, it may actually pick it up. And then you tell it, no, oh, please don't use this region. And then you see that it starts to focus on the more interesting, hopefully also more correct version. And then you can get feedback um, again. We were also doing a user study there and it's very much supporting what is already in a sense known uh, from the literature, but now extending it to the explanation part namely that people trust highly accurate machines. It's this very well-known bias um, of machine, but uh, the trust really drops when wrong behavior is witnessed. This is really standard. We were just validating what is known already from the literature. Now with explanations, it's like you can increase the trust in early iterations, um, even when the machine is showing lower predictive performance. But again, these explanations should be correct. Right? So put it slightly different, um, the explanation should not be really wrong. So you really want to have meaningful explanations in a sense. So should we care? Uh, let me start with an example that is not coming from uh, the medical domain, but we were looking at plant phenotyping. And it's a similar situation we are here using of higher dimensional data because we were looking at hyper, uh, um, um, 
hyperspectral images. So it's instead of just having RGB, you have, uh, in this case, I think up to 1000 of these wavelengths and then how much energy is reflected there. And we were applying on our data, a standard deep network. Um, don't ask me exactly which one. I think it was, I think it was VGG, but I don't recall anymore. So what is happening there is that it very well um, predicts whether this plant is um, ill or not. So we, we had um, different samples and, and control and we, uh, injected, so to say, a particular disease, and we were wondering whether we can predict this disease earlier than by naked eye. And yes, the system was very well doing it, but it was so good that our biological expert was a little bit nervous. And he was really saying, no, no, I don't trust that. It's, it's, it's unbelievable good. And so we were running this explainable AI techniques. And then what you were seeing is that it was starting to catch um, or to make use of features, input areas, that were not really related to the plant, but only indirectly looking at the nutrition in a sense um, it was making use of, right? So when it becomes ill, it was um, sucking out of the, uh, it's called agar, it's this fluid that we are using to keep it alive, the, the piece of plant there. And then it was making use of changes in this agar in order to predict whether it was um, a diseased piece of plant or not. So biologically, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, physically, you can still make argue that yes, indeed, the agar is helping the plant, but biologically, it's really not making sense because we know that the disease is on the plant and not somewhere else. So then we were putting the biological expert into the loop. In particular, here simulated by a general rule, um, encoding where explanation should be and where not. And then all of a sudden you see that it starts focusing really on the areas that makes much more sense, at least to the biologist. Now coming back um, to COVID, we were also applying it um, to COVID. And hey, I'm not the, the COVID expert. I'm not a medical doctor. Our main point here um, initially was to show, be a little bit more careful, right? Not just collect some data, uh, on Kegel, for example, you found these data sets where different types of uh, images were just combined. And particularly you were combining at some point even children, um, uh, images of children's where, you know, they have to raise their arms anyhow when they do the imaging. And then all of a sudden you get all these confounders in there. Um, similar in other data sets, the ones that we used here, of course, because you may use even different imaging systems some other labeling that is standard there, like left and right, may, may get picked up, right? And so again, by providing this feedback um, after learning, you essentially change your loss function, right? It's a parameterized loss function and the system can continue to learn. And so at least then our medical doctors in this case uh, were, were quite happy about it. Now, uh, we don't want to stop there because I think even uh, medical images are much more complicated than just applying a deep network. Because if you talk to some um, medics, right, it's like they're making use of the background knowledge. They may, in at least few cases, even debate different areas and try to uh, relate them to each other. So we were picking up this challenge. And here you see images and you can have much more of these images. It's called the clever data set, where it's really hard for a deep network to understand the scene if you're not going for a much more complex um, deep network. And in particular here, we were making use of what is called a neural symbolic system. So if you just apply a standard convolutional neural network, the concept underlying, which is large cube and large cylinder, cannot really be captured because there's not a notion of object here, right? If you go for then explanations and revising the system by the explanations, then this doesn't really help you because still it's not a notion of objects in there. So what we were doing is we were making use of um, a neural symbolic concept learner. It's a new variant of what, uh, what Josh Tenenbaum was um, presenting two years ago and last year in particular at iClear, uh, making use of slot attention and then some set transformer um, to get some symbolic middle layer. And the symbolic middle layer, you can view a little bit like a table, 
telling you, I see this object having this feature. It's made of this material. It's large, it's small, uh, wh wh whatever. You, you, de you define it. And it's an end-to-end -end differentiable system. So you can now run all these explainable AI um, techniques again, and you get two types of explanations, both in terms of the input, but as well as in terms of this symbolic representation. And now, of course, we can close the loop here and apply what we have seen before, but you can now provide even stronger feedback that was not um, possible before, because you can now make on the symbolic level feedback for all images at once. You could say, for example, no, 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 never make use of a gray object to explain um, your decision, right? So all of a sudden, you move really to the concept and that sense also semantical level to provide feedback. So coming back to the third wave of AI, you see that we are pushing a little bit more on um, the symbolic part here and trying to get closer to the natural language, but still staying on the symbolic level so that we can also plug in probabilistic programming, um, statistical relational techniques so that you can also link to maybe more complex um, medical uh, background. Speaking of that, I think this is really the future of machine learning and AI in um, medicine and to a large extent, because this is really um, a, a big treasure for um, computer science, but also of course for medicine. But this treasure that we have there, it is both textual and it consists of images. So you have uh, procedure treatments, you have genomic data, you have time series. So you have a big, big heterogeneous, multimodal, whatever um, kind of scientific database. And understanding the scientific database is not easy with standard deep networks because they all drive on having this uh, attribute value representation, right? You, you get essentially a big Excel table uh, as training data. So this is where we are currently pushing a lot based on what we did um, in the previous, I don't know, 15 years where we were working on probabilistic programming and statistical relational learning and now getting also this deep networks in there. So it's a, this really this neural symbolic approach there. And you will see, I guess, another talk highlighting that later by Friram Natarajan from UT, UT Dallas. Just to tell you, it works. So here we were looking at the Cardia longitudinal study, which is um, about, I think, 5,000 patients coming in every five years. It was running already for 40 years. By now, I guess, 45 or even 50 years. So there's a lot of knowledge in there. And you get these models really rather quickly. And they are too, also pretty easy to interpret, I mean, at least easier than a black box model like a deep neural network. So here, for example, um, the first decision to make is whether you're male or female. And this is pretty well known from medical statistics that females have a lower heart attack risk. Uh, we were trying to predict heart, heart attack risks um, than males and so on and so on. So you can do that. Uh, it was the whole uh, electronic health record we got there from, from Cardia. Um, and you can build these models in a few split seconds and these results are already, I don't know, five um, years old. So you can really boost that much more by all the current technology. So with that, let me also conclude. And I hope I also told you now a little bit about this vision of the third wave of AI and why we really believe that we have to move beyond um, deep um, neural networks, differentiable programming, by also including databases, focusing also on the human part and somehow getting, get, getting this human-like or human-centric AI really running. And this is why I'm so excited why also Aniban is here, but also um, all the other ones and also at Fraunhofer, but also all the colleagues in, in Frankfurt, Marburg and Gießen and the Universal Hospital uh, hospitals there, because this is a great challenge, right? And together we can really push each other. And that's why I'm so happy that we got the Hessian Center running now. We're still building it up, but we got the basic funding and look forward to collaborating with all of you. Thank you for the invitation.